capitalistic democratic society and as a result we pay taxes to an entity called the government so that we develop institutions and we do it at the federal level, state level, county level, city level. We invest in our pool of resources to create institutions that support the common good. Now, what does the common good mean? That's public policy. It means how do you um, make a decision about am I my brother's keeper? And if so, how so? And how do you divide up the pie? See, we can share dignity because it's infinite. We can love each other. We can pray in church. And we can believe that we're all profoundly equal. But the proof comes into the real world of dividing up the pie. So the institutions become the vehicle for dividing up the pie. There's only so many dollars. Um, the economy produces so much profitability. Who divides up the pie? And who gets what? So poor people get the least. And institutions that serve poor people typically are incompetent because they have no um, demand from powerful resources saying you must respond to the families in this community. Because the family is the economic unit of the society. It's the smallest one. It's where dependent young are brought into the nest, the human nest, and grown, raised so they can take care of themselves and their own offspring and their dependent elderly. That's an economic agenda. It's not just a moral one, a spiritual one, a social one, it's an economic one. How do you feed your young? How do you socialize them so that they have good enough abilities to participate and produce in society? How do you make sure they're stable, protected from assaults and injury or lack of stimulation? How do you make sure they feel valued, feel unconditionally loved and embraced? How do you ensure they have some sense of vision and hope for themselves? Well, the institutions in our community are supposed to help families do that. We're no longer an agrarian farm culture where you had a whole bunch of kids on the farm and they worked the farm and we all survived. I was born in one of those environments in 1949 to a poor family, but we had some land and we could grow some food. Even though my mother walked to school while the bus of white kids went by and the white boys threw stuff at this little tiny bird-like child. And my daughter cries when my mother talks about these stories of her childhood. Nonetheless, the family could feed their children. Mm -hmm. And I was born to a family where I didn't know what poverty was because my grandmother could cook for real. Mm -hmm. well, we get to this industrial era where you could work Baltimore as an example. You could work in the mills, Detroit, and you didn't have to have a lot of education. And if you had an alcohol problem, whatever, as long as you were dry on the weekdays and standing that line earning that money, you could take care of your family. But then the auto industry crashes because we're building big old cars and we're uh, not looking at the gas costs and the Japanese come and almost pull the rope out of Baltimore is still reeling from that crash and then we know what's happened in Detroit. But we're not in that era anymore. We're in the era of information age, technology and abstract. We've gone past the white collar days. We're zooming all the way past to abstraction. And so how do institutions help families transition their children into being able to economically survive and compete? You no longer raise your children by yourself. You have to have support from the institutions. Schools, workplace, health systems. They've got to work. And what African American kids get mostly is child welfare, maybe and juvenile justice, but they don't get much out of our public institutions that support them and support their families. They don't. So incompetent institutions are those that do not help the family thrive, do not help the family raise their children in an appropriate fashion, do not hear the families when they make demands 
Perry in Connecticut talked about with all his black kids, boys, going to college. And he was at GW and he made a statement about every black parent should insist that the school their child teaches them or takes them out. Don't allow the school not to teach your children. Well, that's a very powerful, aggressive statement. But do we understand how to hold institutions accountable? Because it is institutional. It's quite big. So when I look at the families that I've served, they aren't advocates for their children. They don't know how to advocate for their children in these institutions. They tend to be reactive to them or to buy into the shame and the blame that they usually are given. And so most of the programs that we have spend a lot of time with family empowerment, but mostly reinforcing their self-esteem. We did a study on uh, these under 25-year-old homeless parents in this wealthy county. They were of color, disproportionately, and most of them had not been in child welfare. They were passed around their families, and they just described men rolling over and rolling out on them and leaving them with kids, and they felt fairly hopeless. And they wept when they heard the other girls in the room felt the same way because they thought they were alone. We have a lot of that. But on the other hand, when they find in an institutional setting, advocacy, resources are directed around meeting their need, you'd be stunned at how resilient a family can be and how a mother can recover, how a father can take hold of his responsibilities to parent. We have a men's in motion program in DC and these guys are coming from jail, and they really need to be around other guys and the sea guys who say, you can, you, know, you can work through the mama's anger or the children's fear or resistance. You gotta step up because you're the dad. No. 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 No lupus. No lupus. If we're going to say no to lupus, we need to know lupus. <sighs> lupus has completely changed my life. Lupus is one of those things that takes over somebody's body and you don't know anything about it. It's just unpredictable, it's tricky, confusing. There's certain things that I can't do, but I still get up every morning and do it. It's really a cool mystery. Lupus can impact any organ in the body any organ. It was attacking my kidney. Some people, it's the brain, it's the heart. I had gone into stage four kidney failure, which sent me into respiratory failure, which almost made me lose my life. When I was first diagnosed, that's when it really kicked in, just knowing that there was no cure. I really felt like maybe I might not be able to make it through this. We don't look like we have the disease, and I think that's also part of the problem. You can be sick even though you don't look sick. That is one of the cruel aspects of it, is there sometimes people don't believe you. Lupus does not discriminate. It can affect men, women, white, black, older, younger. I've had lupus for 10 years. I am 17 years old. I am 11. We've got to find a way to get through this. The Lupus Foundation of America is a great organization because they're getting people out there, letting people know what it's all about. And by knowing more, we'll be better able to help and unlock the mysteries that do surround lupus. There is something we can do. There is hope. Let's take this moment and turn it into a movement. End the confusion and end lupus. There is hope. We just have to get involved. I haven't given up. I challenge you to know. No. 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 No, lupus. Go to lupus.org slash no and help solve this cruel mystery. Anxiety has affected me since really the beginning. I was dealing with this all by myself. I was totally isolated. Nobody knew. Everybody loved Shelby. She was a straight-A student, but a year ago, my sister lost her life to suicide. I know that my girlfriend struggled really hard with telling people she had this issue. She could hardly tell me. You know, it hurts me because I feel like a lot of my friends have struggled with not being able to admit that they're dealing with these issues. The last school year, there were four teen suicides that happened in Palo Alto. That really sent our entire community into a shock. 
Help us mind our future. Let's tag it. Tweet it. Share it. Instagram it. Let's snap it. Me importa el futuro. I think that social media is a very powerful tool for spreading these issues in a way that's approachable and also really powerful. These personal stories can become almost anthems or just rallying points for other people who feel the same thing. I did attempt suicide and I tried to end my life, but I bounced back. I'm really thankful that I saw that post because they might not think that they're helping me, but I really appreciated it so much. Shelby, I guess, never really felt that comfortable coming out and saying to us, you know, I've been really sad. I think, you know, there's something I need to do here. You know, if you take that step, take that initiative to reach out, you know, tell someone that you're struggling, it can make the biggest difference. I'm starting the conversation. I'm posting about mental health. I'm ending the stigma. We're, We're socializing, socializing hope. hope. I like that. Me importa el futuro. Together, we can bring change to mind. I think ending the stigma is the only way to start the conversation and have people feel comfortable enough. They can talk about it. They can seek help. Show us what you're doing to start the conversation and end the stigma. I'm here for my flu shot, and I understand that there are options for people who are 65 and older. There are, but you don't look 65. It's very flattering, but you know who I am. What if I said, who's the boss of my health? You've never seen who's the boss. My boss is in the back. Flu season is here, and people who are 65 and older need to ask about the vaccine made specifically for their age. Judith Light, come on back. Visit the National Council on Aging at ncoa.org slash flu and talk to your doctor about vaccine options for people 65 and older. No two days are alike. So every day, you prepare. For yourself. For those you love. For whatever the day may bring. Being prepared is a part of who you are. But in the case of a disaster, preparation isn't always front of mind. In an emergency when help and resources may not be available for days, being prepared is more important than ever. It's up to everyone to be informed about what types of emergencies might occur where you live or visit. Knowing the best responses for your personal circumstances is the key to maintaining your health, safety, and independence. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency and how a personal support network can assist you. Build a kit that contains the specific things you need to survive for several days. Food and water, medication and supplies, as well as any important documents you may need. Being prepared is a part of who you are, and disaster preparation is no different. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Be informed, make a plan, build a kit, get involved. Ready.gov slash my plan. to have no control over anything. You could go to a spiritual place and say, well, that's true for all of us. Except from a human perspective, we have to feel like we have some control of ourselves. I think when you deal with extreme poverty, you don't feel like you can have control over yourself. You, you have thoughts that rush in where you buy into the stereotypes, you buy into the shame, there's something about me, you buy into the blame, it's my fault. You buy into the hopelessness that this is the way it is. It's going to be roaches and hiding from the landlord or sleeping on somebody's sofa till they get tired of it or trying to beg for something from somebody or hustle somebody or rob Peter to pay Paul or say no, no, no to your kid, I ain't got it. 
what you gonna do? You, you know, I don't have it. Uh, constantly facing the fact that you bring disappointment to your child because you can't provide them with some of the basics. You may not be able to bring them a new coat in the winter time or shoes that fit for school. That's shameful because you brought the child into the world and you can't take care of them in the very basic rule of food, clothing, shelter. You can't do that. Not with consistency and predictability. And then you decide you can do whatever you have to do to get it. Then you got to deal with that shame. So you deal with people who may be at risk for being incarcerated for what they're doing to survive, but you need to survive. So you hang with them and share it. You may deal with working two or three jobs and you're never home. And you make your child responsible for themselves or for their younger siblings. You deal with that guilt. You can't win with poverty. Um, you can't buy the kind of food that really is healthy. And so your kids eat whatever you can get or whatever anyone gives them. Or they eat three times a day in school and bring home some food on Friday to last them over the weekend. And you're happy they have that. You're happy when the school counselor can find a way to get your kid a uniform or a volunteers in a program have a carnival and your child can have a normal experience and you count on someone else to give it to them. Mm. The parent who stood at the airport, poor parent, when his son came back from a London trip that NCCF paid for with money from foundation and volunteers, fourth grade boy, I was surprised that the father let him go. He took the risk. He knew it was important. It would be a transforming moment for his son. But as his son came through the gate, I smiled because I was coming with the little boy. And I said, he was great. He learned to cock me. And the father said, he has a passport and I don't have one. The fear when you're poor that you have to almost let your child go because you can't give him anything but you don't want to let them go, but you may have to. And I smiled and I said to the father, sir, if you had not paid for that passport, and I had a big fight with my staff, it's $100 for passports, you can't make the parents. I said, no, they have to pay for that. They have to pay for something. Because I was able to look him in his face and say, sir, if you had not paid for that passport and applied for it, your son would not have gone on this trip. You gave him this trip. Don't you ever forget that. And when you let him fly, they always come back to you, sir. And then the smile came on his face. So poverty distorts our truth, which is no matter how poor the person is, no matter how poor the parent is, they are inherently invaluable to their children. Their children always want their mother and their father of birth. Poverty distorts that truth. It creates illusions that you're less than, you're not as good, you have nothing to offer, and makes you desperate. But also, as Cornel West says, you die an existential death. You have no purpose, hope, love, and meaning because poverty takes over because you're too busy struggling to survive. So when I see families who take whatever help they can get and take off with it, it is the most rewarding thing in the world, and I see it all the time. And so I think it's important for us to talk about the impact of poverty, because it's traumatic. But I also want us to realize it's not permanent. I came from poverty. My mom was a teen mom. She sent her two kids to the best schools in this country, and she figured it out. Resilient, using resources, using support. I see families do that. Black poor families do that all the time. But the incompetent institutions may not know how to respond to them and support them appropriately. That's why I see the dilemma. Because we get caught up as professionals in having the answer rather than hearing their voices. Hearing what will trigger their sense of hope and their willingness to change. Under what conditions will they trust take the risk to change? So, yes, Dad, you've been locked down. Yeah, it's been pretty devastating. Yeah, you've been locked out a couple of times, but you're still very important to your son. 
and he may have some work to do. He may have to show him something different, but he needs you to do that. And only you can do that, and we're going to help you do that. We want to eat some food, have a group, talk to some other men, kick it. And we're going to talk about the fact that you were deprived of a father and you hunger for one yourself. And you miss one, you're not sure you know how to be one. We want to talk about all that because we can talk that through. And you can be a great dad. So I go to a graduation ceremony at J.C. Knoll Community School and there's about 30 dads in there. And I'm the keynote speaker along with this other guy. And the other guys look at me like, father initiative expert, he looks at me like, well, what are you going to talk about? I mean, you're the woman. Mm -hmm. And I do understand I am not a man. I'm not confused about that. So I stood up, I said, okay, my staff said, you guys are great. You graduated, you're fathers. You tell me one by one, what is about you that makes you a good father? And they all looked, and one stood up, and he said very quietly, I come to my son's school and I know all his teachers. That makes me a good dad. And I made a comment about, yeah, that's where your son is probably needing your alliance the most, because school's a scary place to be. Everybody applauded, and then each voice got louder and clearer till they were bragging on themselves. And it was absolutely wonderful because that means they're successful. They understand what it means to be dead, and they've internalized it, and they know how important it is and how good it is. Poverty disallows people to have that natural sense of importance, particularly in a society that this is this wealthy, where there's a discrimination. My dad was a World War II Navy vet that came back with two medals, couldn't get a job in South Carolina, came north with his family, worked for a white guy with no high school education. My dad had like a semester or two at Hampton. And my father was angry till he died. I didn't understand the Navy thing till I had to take care of my dad with Parkinson. I had to go through the VA and dig through the papers and find out. I didn't even know he was a vet. He was so angry that he served his country and didn't get the same benefit because he had to come to Boston and wash cars with more education than his supervisor all because of race. That produces anger because it's impoverishing. Racism is not just we don't like black people alone. It's about deprivation of the economic basis for you to take care of your family. It's vicious. When you have, living on one block, you have 40 families uh, experiencing poverty. What does that do to the community? Well, I think we just saw what it does to the community, didn't we? Just one match blows it up. It's just a constant undercurrent of disgruntlement and confusion um, on one hand. On the other hand, there's something that is also less visible, like kids who take care of each other, adults who take care of other people's kids. Does that make sense? Um, folk who um, may find the funeral the social event of the month, but on the other hand can express the sadness that this could happen to any of us. So it's kind of profound democratic universalization of despair, that none of us are better than anybody else. When we get into these suburbs and affluent echelon, we really don't want to accept the fact that none of us are better than anybody else. And our houses and our yards and our uh, ability to use our money to protect ourselves from that truth, when in fact anybody's black son from any part of our society could be subjected to what just happened in Baltimore. And I think when people live together on a block and share such common desperation, they probably have more respect and value for each other, despite the stereotype. I think there's more going on to do self-help, which is our tradition, 
and help one another, we realize. On the other hand, we lose people because there's not enough in that block to keep to keep all of our children safe and to let them leave the block and do well, like that fourth grader, and come back, bringing back opportunities for his whole family. Because um, children bring back opportunities for their whole family. Because it's their journey as they step off their parents' shoulders and move forward. They bring back opportunities. They take care of their elderly. And if the community can't produce that opportunity for the child, it spirals down and the spirit grows. And eventually the community blows. And nobody wins in that. It stopped the whole city, didn't it? Shut it down in front of the whole country. And what that did is trigger awareness that that could happen anywhere. Anywhere. Because that kind of desperation is growing too many places in this country. I didn't want to talk about it earlier. Why would I want to seem like this sad sack? Those are all the lies that I told, told myself. It's like, oh, if I talk about this, even, pro even professionally with my job, if I talk about this, uh, people won't want to watch me. It's not important enough. And e even now as I'm hearing myself saying all those things, like, wow, man, I really wish that I would have spoken out earlier because there's nothing like being able to shine a light on those secrets. Those secrets kill. The, the secret of keeping all that to yourself and putting on that mask that'll eat away at you daily. It ate away at me daily. It's difficult for men in general, I think, because of just, just the way that we're made, raised. You feel any of the negative emotions or that dark cloud settle on you, and you feel like you need to cry out or speak to someone about it, no, I'm, I'm not gonna do that because I'm a man. What kind of man would I sound like if I told somebody, hey, I am, I'm, I'm so sad, I'm cripplingly sad, I, I can't get out of bed, I just, I, I feel empty, help me. Psh, I would be some sissy, I'd be soft. That's what you're taught. That's what you were programmed. And, uh, and that's what kills us. So in speaking about it uh, on ET and being honest, folks have come out of the woodwork, people that I haven't heard from in years, complete strangers, a ton of my, mostly on Twitter and on Facebook and social media. That's, that, that's been an amazing gauge of all the love and so many people, it's echoed the exact same sentiment. Thank you so much for speaking because I felt that I couldn't. Anxiety has affected me since really the beginning. I was dealing with this all by myself. I was totally isolated. Nobody knew. Everybody loved Shelby. She was a straight A student, but a year ago, my sister lost her life to suicide. I know that my girlfriend struggled really hard with telling people she had this issue. She could hardly tell me. You know, it hurts me because I feel like a lot of my friends have struggled with not being able to admit that they're dealing with these issues. The last school year, there were four teen suicides that happened in Palo Alto. That really sent our entire community into a shock. Help us mind our future. Let's tag it, tweet it, share it, Instagram it. 
Let's snap it. Me importa el futuro. I think that social media is a very powerful tool for spreading these issues in a way that's approachable and also really powerful. These personal stories can become almost anthems or just rallying points for other people who feel the same thing. I did attempt suicide and I tried to end my life, but I bounced back. I'm really thankful that I saw that post because they might not think that they're helping me, but I really appreciated it so much. Shelby, I guess, never really felt that comfortable coming out and saying to us, you know, I've been really sad. I think, you know, there's something I need to do here. You know, if you take that step, take that initiative to reach out, you know, tell someone that you're struggling, it can make the biggest difference. I'm starting the conversation. I'm posting about mental health. I'm ending the stigma. We're, We're socializing, socializing hope. hope. I like that. Me importa el futuro. Together, we can bring change to mind. I think ending the stigma is the only way to start the conversation and have people feel comfortable enough. They can talk about it. They can seek help. Show us what you're doing to start the conversation and end the stigma. some research now in 200 black males who were placed in our care over the last couple of years. And the research, we've looked at data on the first 75, and when these just black males, when they first come into the attention of the system is around 13, 12, 13, when the pubertal thing hooks place. So this is the precursor so has been in great difficulty. They start getting involved with criminal activity, juvenile justice. Um, by about 14 or 15, they're getting diagnoses, some of them for being behaviorally dysregulated and psychiatric diagnoses. And then um, by 15, 16, it's like we can't do nothing with them. And the reason why I can describe that is because I get those boys from Baltimore here. And so I'm going to tell you what they look like here around this issue of structure. So this is a wrong where I have hearings with boys who are off the chain behaviorally. They won't respond to the limits. We're, we're open setting. They volunteer to come here, generally to keep from being in Sheldonham or some other place or a psychiatric facility. And they come, as I told you, with their BMO hip hop thing, and they're all big and bad and thugs and stuff. And I confront them, and my staff support me. I go, like, well, you get can let the hype down now. We can let that because we're going to deal with the master. Your kid. <laughs> you can do crazy and you can do bad, but we ain't buying it because we know you'd rather do that than admit that your family didn't figure out how to keep you. Your peeps did not figure out how to give you what you needed. That's not it. I'm here because it ain't got to do with my mama, my grandma. Uh, I don't, my daddy ain't in it. I don't even know him. And I go there like, nah, really, your family failed you because there are other kids that are off the chain, but they're still with their people. <laughs> They've managed to kind of hold on to them and get through adolescence and uh, push back what adolescents do normatively, developmentally, which is push off the family and deal with their peers. That's what they're supposed to do. They come back to their family after they become young adults. Uh, but in that adolescent stage, they want to be with their peers, and that's normal. Um, so families have to hold on while their adolescence is pushing off. Families have to model, parents have to model for their adolescents how to get their own needs met appropriately. If the parent can't meet their own needs, which would be to provide food, clothes, something for their kid, to be able to provide structure, right? to be unconditional, to advocate for them in these incompetent systems that touch their child's life, then what happens to this journey of pushing up? They almost don't have anybody to push off on, which what all the other kids have. They have like, I'm not a kid, you got some money. Um, you need to let me go. I don't know what to do about this relationship. You know, that kind of push, that kind of push pull. Well, if the family, the parents aren't being parental, Showing how they get their needs met, holding on, knowing that the job of the youth is a push back. What happens? We get these kids that are big and bad and tough, and they haven't had that. They haven't had anyone holding on to them, setting limits. Setting limits is different than telling you what to do. Someone say, no, you, you do that, this is what you're not going to get. You do this, here's what you're going to get rewarded. It's setting structure, 
and not letting the youth do whatever they want to do without consequences. Because it's not the real world. So I sit here and say, what's my job? I teach them. My job is to keep you safe. That means we have rules. We have rules here, we have rules in the community, we have rules in our society. And the rules are primarily about your safety and about your vision for yourself, your well-being. And I'm telling you, the most common thing that happens with the kids that we get here is they need attention. They desperately want the structure. Yeah, they're gonna kick off because they are afraid of it. They don't know what it is. They're, they want to recreate the chaos and the in and out, walk in and out, and we work it through. That's not how it works. I've had kids coming from Baltimore, 6 to 10 years old, that have been in the streets since they were 8, 9 years old. It's not uncommon. Um, selling drugs by the time they're 10, 11 years old. Being thrown out their aunt's apartment when they're looking to eat at 9. I mean, you hear the stories and you're saying, they were little, little kids, and now they're big kids. And all the police and all the adults see is a big strapping boy or a little boy with a lot of mouth who may be even charismatic and charming but will lie to you in a heartbeat and do whatever he wants with no guilt or anxiety. And that's what we work with when they come here. And so structure becomes important. And what I, we just recently had a retreat with the staff, and the, the staff led themselves because our challenge was talk to me about trauma. I said, you guys got this behavioral program going on. And let me tell you, you're losing some kids because they're not responding to it. So what do you think is going on? So by the end of the day, they were able to admit, this whole team, that 90% of the time we don't implement the structure. Because these kids are tough to implement structure with because you're not used to it. So that means how do you get 25 professionals implementing the same structure? And I said, until you all tell the truth, you can't do nothing for them because you must model your ability to tell the truth and manage yourselves to them. That's what you're giving them. So we went out to dinner and they talked about their strengths and the opportunity because the next day they were going to be meeting with the boys. And I knew they didn't believe me. I said, you do it right. You do facilitated conversations around two or three questions. I challenged them to do it. And I promised I was coming, but I didn't show up because I wanted to do it without, without me. As you see, then they're still awed by how the boys open up, particularly the Baltimore boys who really come from, it's pretty hard in Baltimore for them, particularly the Baltimore boys, particularly the Baltimore boys. I kind of like in the most because they're the most hurting that come here because the whole environment colludes with their families not just the families the whole environment and the questions that I challenge them to ask the boys in small groups of four or five boys with two or three staff and then two or three staff watching them and having them rotate through the questions and build in a reward system where there's five different items and if they show five different behaviors consistently through these full group conversation, they get all of them. Things like uh, candy, things like stress balls, things that they like. And all the kids got through. You know the question about? What's the impact you think on your life of having been taken from your family? Hmm. Basic. What does your father mean to you and what's his role in your life? And the kids opened up so much talking to each other and the staff. So the staff were stunned around just how receptive they are. But you have to create the safe place and you have to have honest, authentic adults who are willing to go there. So let me just tell you, I think one of the impacts of poverty is that we often don't see the universal truth that everybody wants to be seen. Kids want us to be real, not real about how the streets are, but real about what's happening to them in their lives. And we don't talk about that with them. When you say to the mom, um, you just let him go in now, it's dangerous out there. 
I say to that same mom, you're going to be calling me crying because you're going to be burying him or visiting him with a chicken box in jail. And you will have contributed to that because you should go back to the moment that you made him and what a good time you were having. And you owe him. You owe him, mom. So are you going to deliver for him? Or are you going to give excuses because you're responsible for this boy? Oh yeah, you are. And we're going to help you with that. And it might mean some parenting education. So ways to think about a behavior contract with him, some discipline, because it's hard to rework this. But it can be reworked, it's reworked all the time because you control all the opportunities for him. You have that much influence, you are all that, and he needs you to be his mama, he wants you to be his mama. Black boys love their mamas. I created a whole theory once and did this presentation of Child of the League and it was packed, I was shocked, where I looked at this thing um, about black male children who grieved their mothers and they weren't psychiatric or delinquent. They were acting up because they loved their mothers. They were attached. I proved that they had been with their mothers since they were at least seven. No one was talking about their mother. So she said, we're not going to talk about their mother because it'll trigger them. I said, how can you not talk about their mother when that's all they're thinking about is their mother? They're without their mother at 14, 15. You're afraid to talk about it because it may upset them? Are you kidding? Are you kidding? It, it, not rational, but professionals, we get real intellectual about this. And all the kid wants us is to be honest and to tell them the truth. And so if the mother is homeless, being beaten up, mentally ill, the black boy feels like he's supposed to be taking care of her. And he feels responsible, because that's our culture. So how do we manage that in our process? So what does he do? So who does he look for the model? What do I do with this? Where's dad? What are the models in his community? Are the models men who are exploitative and abusive? And where's the church and confronting that? Because some of those models are in the church. So where do you go? Who do you talk to? So these boys are desperate for honest, authentic relationship. We did the study and we had 54 words they described themselves that they thought people saw them as. Only two or three were good. I have these black male staff, I asked them, so what do you think about that? Because the female staff, black and white, were like horrified that there was so much negativity in the way they thought people treated, thought of them. And the PhD from Columbia, black male, he said, no matter what I achieved, I think people still see me that way. Anybody gasp? Our boys want to be able to, the group of black men who are big time, um, rights of passage mentors and I met one in the street once I said so what you been doing he said we can me mentor this group and we got together I said you know I'm a nosy socialist so I said well, so what you learn from your group I mean you're all high power black men married raised kids chosen community high power professionals achievers wow you're gonna mentor kids who are at risk and me so when you got together what did you what did you talk about I'm just being nosy because I'm clear that I'm not a male I don't have any ambivalence about that. So I want to be informed by my male colleagues. And he said, which was informative to me, he said, for the first time, we were in a room with people just like us. I said, how'd that feel? He said, one of us said, asked, have any of you ever felt homicidal? And we all realized we all had. We have sat on so much stuff to succeed. We've sat on it for our children, for our families, so we could make it. We've sat on so much stuff and we shared our homicidal feelings of age. I said, well, well, as I adopted my first male child, I've had I have daughters, biological daughters and daughters, and I sat in a circle with a white male who graduated from the foster care system, and we heard this quote from Arthur Ashe, living the life of a black man in America is more difficult than dying of AIDS. And they kept reading that line, always was across our eyes in a circle. And think about what comes to our mind when we hear that. Then we open our eyes, go pick somebody to talk to, 
five minutes exchange about what came to mind. He went first, he picked me, he went first. He said, I can't imagine that because I've had a friend die of AIDS. I was speechless because I had this little black boy I adopted who was prenatal exposed to drugs and I had to raise him. And I wept because I realized that mm, we have a campaign at that time of American response to AIDS. And we changed the whole societal response to that epidemic. But there was no public health campaign for black males who were killing each other, who were dying from violence. And as the mother of a little black boy, I felt it and it hit me in my gut. No way. I don't think I even could have anticipated, although I have a brother, I had a father, or I have males in my life, I didn't get it. And so, you know, when you tell me about this 11 year old boy walking in and out of his home with no structure, he's a casualty in the making. But the good news is, if we understand better, and that's our, 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 our hope in doing this research and this work, it's called practice to research to practice methodology. We want to go to have the kids tell us how they can be engaged, because without the engagement, without the relationship, they don't try something new, like think about the world differently. Because poverty doesn't give you those opportunities. Poverty is vicious. And then the family structure is so busy trying to survive, they're not attending to these fundamental truths. You have to keep your boy with you. He has to be your priority. He's extremely fragile. He's not a little man. He's a little boy. He can't become a man until he's had boyhood and his dependency fully rewarded. So we're taking our kids here to Puerto Rico for vacation. We have people raising money to take them. We have means we sit around and talk about bullying and why I can't have it my role What's bullying, the experience with bullying, why they bully each other, why there's zero tolerance. And they'll sit here and talk to me for two or three hours. We have the focus group on what is trauma as a black man, male, what's that look like? And they talk about life is trauma, Dr. C. And then they want to come back to the focus group while the male staff are sitting there stunned. So then we have folks with the black male staff and they're having the same stories. And that takes time, but it's valuable time. And what happens with poverty and stereotypes, nobody thinks that's important. Because life is important. Black life matters is what we say now. I'm a brown alum. That's a big movement in my undergrad. It is important. All life is important, but black life is challenged. And our kids want us to tell the truth. We can't turn it around, but it takes a lot to turn around and be so much better if we could prevent it, wouldn't it? Hi, I'm here for my flu shot, and I understand that there are options for people who are 65 and older. There are, but you don't look 65. It's very flattering, but you know who I am. I just turned 65, and I know the immune system gets weaker with age. Well, I don't think that we've met, but there's no way you were 65. What if I said I only have one life to live, so I need protection against the flu? How about... Who's the boss of my health? You've never seen who's the boss. Oh, my, my boss is in the back. See, flu season is here and people 65 and older need to ask about the vaccine made specifically for their age. And it's particularly important for people who have conditions like heart disease and diabetes. To the Hawaii, <laughs> great seeing you. Come on back. Visit the National Council on Aging at ncoa.org slash flu to learn more and talk to your doctor about vaccine options for people 65 and older. Look, I'm really sorry about that. I thought you were 35. Don't apologize. Honestly? Honestly. Honestly? We should have used a condom, but we got distracted. I know I should get tested for HIV, but honestly, I'm afraid to find out. Honestly, we've been together for a while, so 
getting tested never really crossed my mind. Honestly, no one wants to think about HIV, but there are things that everyone can do to help protect their sexual health. Condoms are a great start. Get tested and ask a healthcare provider about all of your prevention options. Because honestly, our health is worth protecting. don't understand your mission, you're not delivering, you're not going to figure out who you're serving and what they really need from you. And our institutions are full of people collecting checks. And they can't work for me. They can't work for me. Because you know you've made a difference if you're a school when your kids are graduating and can pass a test, not graduate from MCPS. Montgomery County Public Schools and go to Montgomery College and take remediation courses for two years. Do you follow me? I'm not talking about fake services. I'm talking about you've educated somebody. You've helped someone be healthier. You've helped someone develop some vocational, some technical, some economic skills, some life skills, soft skills. You know, you can see it when you deliver an influence change. And the client claims it as their own. So I think we have institutions that are not held accountable. I think we have leaders that are disconnected from their product. And I think when that happens, poor people, poor black people particularly, always suffer because it's not their instinct to hold that system accountable. Now they may be reactive and scream and holler and someone pays them off or placates them but we're talking about having a real delivery of entitlement, not governmental entitlement, entitlement to participate in society and get the support you need. All of us need support to make it in this kind of economy. All parents need institutional support to raise their kids. We're not in the farm anymore. How do There's some efforts to try to soften the long-term result of having a felony charge because they're suddenly realizing we're producing all these people that can't work. <laughs> so duh, that's backfiring, okay? Right? Duh. So you're in jail for trying to support your family selling drugs and now you can never ever work again for the rest of your life. That really makes a lot of no sense, doesn't it? <laughs> right? So incarceration affects the family economically, affects the family morally. I've had kids who saw the cops bang down the door, kick it in, and brutally arrest the father in front of them for something he didn't do. So now he's incarcerated. No one in the family believes he did it because he wasn't there when it happened because he was home or someone else that didn't matter because he didn't have a lawyer, so he's locked up for it. So it affects the family morally. You have kids who don't know whether they should agree with their daddy, agree with the law enforcement. They don't know what, what's a good guy. They have no trust in the legal system or in law enforcement. So we have more, what's, who's right and who's wrong? What is right and wrong? What's the law? We see the social um, impact. The stigma. Um, even caretakers of kids whose parents are incarcerated. Um, I looked at 108 kids in DC uh, directly, and about 20% of them had both of their parents incarcerated. I looked at Jerry and Consent um, study that I did with 300 kids, and we had like whole generations locked up together, like the father and all of his brothers all locked up at the same time. So then the kid sees that this is life. This is how you do it. So it's called like, I, I know folk. Then you got the correctional officers and the inmates having relationships that stem to relationship to the victims and to each other and all kinds of, it becomes a social alternative structure that's chaotic and confusing in the sense of has nothing to do with what's happening outside in the real world. So when someone leaves that structured chaos called incarceration, the structured chaos, they come out in the real world, I see kids watching their parents struggle with adjustment. And 
the programs that we provide really is about supporting them social emotionally as much as anything. Before they even get to the economic thing, it's like, you're with us, you back. We embrace you. So we bring you into another social structure that's embracing and not judgmental and hopeful and expectant and will support you. So if folk don't have that when they come out, they're going back. I didn't want to talk about it earlier. Why would I want to seem like this sad sack? Those are all the lies that I told, told myself. It's like, oh, if I talk about this, even, pro even professionally with my job, if I talk about this, uh, people won't want to watch me. It's not important enough. And e even now as I'm hearing myself saying all those things, like, wow, man, I really wish that I would have spoken out earlier because there's nothing like being able to shine a light on those secrets. Those secrets kill. The, the secret of keeping all that to yourself and putting on that mask, that'll eat away at you daily. It ate away at me daily. It's difficult for men in general, I think, because of just, just the way that we're made, raised. You feel any of the negative emotions or that dark cloud settle on you, and you feel like you need to cry out or speak to someone about it, no, I'm, I'm not gonna do that because my man. What kind of man would I sound like if I told somebody, hey, I am, I'm, I'm so sad. I'm cripplingly sad. I, I can't get out of bed. I just, I, I feel empty. Help me. Psh, that would be some sissy, I'd be soft. That's what you're taught. That's what you were programmed. And, uh, and that's what kills us. So in speaking about it uh, on ET and being honest, folks have come out of the woodwork. People that I haven't heard from in years, complete strangers, a ton of my, mostly on Twitter and on Facebook and social media. That's, that, that's been an amazing gauge of all the love and so many people, it's echoed the exact same sentiment. Thank you so much for speaking because I felt that I couldn't. We're always ready for action. We can do it in two minutes. Now, when I was in high school, I couldn't do it in two minutes. By the time I got to college, two minutes was a cinch. I really like it when a guy can do it in under two minutes. The key to my marriage is doing it in under two minutes. I can do it in two minutes. I can do it in less than two minutes. I can do it in under two minutes myself and with my boyfriend. Each year, the Red Cross responds to 66,000 disasters. Most of them are home fires. Most of them are home fires. Ooh. I know. Whoa. Seven people die each day on average from home fires. Seven people a day. That's way too many people. You can save your life and your family's life. Make an escape plan. Make an escape plan. Make an escape plan. It's critical that everyone can get out in under two minutes. I can get from my bedroom to my front door in less than two minutes. Shh! In two minutes. I can take my shirt off, pour glitter all over myself, and still do it in two minutes. Called my mom the other day, told her I did it in under two minutes. She was so proud. One and a half. What? There's no way. Yeah. Check your smoke alarms monthly to make sure they're working properly. Smoke alarms cut your risk of death or injury in half. Half? It's 50%. This little guy, cutting it in half. And if it's beeping at you, <laughs> don't rip it out of the wall. Give it a battery, you know? Make it happy so it can help you get out of the house in time. Make sure to visit redcross.org slash two steps, two minutes. Two steps. Two minutes. Two steps, two minutes. Visit the link below to find out more. Wherever it is. Not there. Right here. here. No two days are alike. So every day, you prepare. For yourself. For those you love.
for whatever the day may bring. Being prepared is a part of who you are. But in the case of a disaster, preparation isn't always front of mind. In an emergency when help and resources may not be available for days, being prepared is more important than ever. It's up to everyone to be informed about what types of emergencies might occur where you live or visit. Knowing the best responses for your personal circumstances is the key to maintaining your health, safety, and independence. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency and how a personal support network can assist you. Build a kit that contains the specific things you need to survive for several days. Food and water, medication and supplies, as well as any important documents you may need. Being prepared is a part of who you are and disaster preparation is no different. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Be informed, make a plan, build a kit, get involved ready.gov slash my plan. Well, it's interesting because you can almost tell what she's feeling by what her son projects. So you've got sons, I get the sons who say, my mama was my daddy. I thank God for her. Almost a kind of idealizing her which translates into her feeling very burdened, feeling like she doesn't have any other choice but to carry this, and feeling worried at all times that it may not be good enough. Then you have the kid who says, my mama, she got rid of my daddy, it's her fault. I don't have a daddy. And she got these other dudes, and they hurt me, they reject me, because you get the dudes who beat up her kid who molest her kid. I mean, I get those kids. And then you have the kid who says, my mom needs me to take care of her. So I think with the single moms, I've seen some powerfully strong ones who are going to raise their sons the best way they can. And even if their kid gets in trouble, they're going to be here, they're going to process this, and they're going to be there for him to support him getting through a bad patch. But I've seen the others who get beat down by that abandonment by the father. They give up on the ability to embrace this little boy because he's, he's giving them these messages about his deprivation, his father grief. And they're grieving too. They're grieving that the commitment didn't work or that he couldn't deliver or that he's abandoned her. And that's a difficult situation, but I've seen mothers work through that too. Talk about that, please. Mm -hmm. The resilience of the mother. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Somehow he, mm -hmm. he goes on a little mm -hmm. too often. Mm -hmm. um, the resilient mother uses help. I see these mamas using church, using girlfriends, using their own brothers, using other males in the community. I see them also developing relationships with males who do become the father surrogate to their sons. I see them working through in the homeless shelter. I see them, and well, I've had that discussion with some of these moms. I see them doing what I call a character building opportunity for their kids where they hit the bottom and they use every resource and they roll out of here with subsidized housing, a job, and new ways of pairing their kids with rules for the house and their kids feeling proud because mama took them through. And they model that you can work through tough times. And yeah, it would be good if you had your dad, but he wasn't here. And I got you. And I see parents do that all the time. All the time. In fact, I'll be honest with you, I see more mothers do that than succumb and abandon their kid. Which is why when they do succumb and abandon their kid, it's really hard for that boy. Because he has seen through his friends other mothers who work and struggle 
They may not get it perfect, but they are there and they're good enough. They're not going to leave their kid. They love their kid and they fight for them. If nothing else, by working two or three jobs sometimes and giving them rules. I remember working on my doctorate and it was too much. It was qualitative, all the stuff. And there was a woman who worked in the pool, a child work for Wake of America. She was a, a administrative assistant. She could type. And I said to her, you like to make some money? She said, I always need my single mother, three kids, two boys. So I remember paying her and I would stand over her and dictate my dissertation because I couldn't type. And she would type. And she would be on the phone. Don't make me come on early and whip your waist. Don't make me do that. I'm trying to do something here. Johnny, sit out. And she'd be mediating from the phone. And then she said, just a minute. I'm going to call you back. And she could do it. Because she was going to make that money. Yeah, yeah, I, was was paying, I was paying top dollar. Yeah. I had it like from 6 o'clock to about 9 o'clock and I had a deadline to get this dissertation done or I was not going to graduate. Right, right. Kaput. So we were two <laughs> dust and mine. So I was... This is on the mission. <laughs> I out. see those mothers. Right, right. And she brought some money home oh, yeah, that month yeah, yeah. and she spent it on her children right. that month. You follow me? Yeah. So I see that kind of mom all the time. That's called resiliency. And... That's powerful stuff. But how do our institutions support that kind of resiliency? How do we support um, helping mothers have access to child care? It's ridiculous. And other Western societies, quality child care, so mothers can get training programs, can learn some skills, can be sure their kids are safe. I mean, poverty takes away all that. Poverty sets up when I was at the hospital women using babysitters, uh, men, sleazy men who say, I'll take care of your kid, and they end up being a molester. But she was trying to figure out how to do it all with no money. Poverty also drives some women to make choices around their mates because they don't want to see anything negative because they need them economically. But I would say to you, though, the majority of single black moms that I know, they work real hard. And what their kids remember when they become adult is how much she cared. And that's the resilient part. There was a study done in D.C. Um, about high-achieving black kids who came out of schools that were poor and came from poor families. And I remember the study, I can't remember the name of it, but it described that what the mothers had in common is they were able to name their kid as special and make demands they expect you to do better. And they could have been laying on the sofa alcoholic, stuttering, stammering, but they conveyed to their child, you are mine, you are valuable, and I expect the best from you. And I think a lot of single parents, struggling mothers who may be imperfect in some of their strategies are conveying that to black children. But remember though, the rest of the world doesn't reinforce it. And that's the struggle. Hi, I'm here for my flu shot, and I understand that there are options for people who are 65 and older. There are, but you don't look 65. It's very flattering, but you know who I am. I just turned 65, and I know the immune system gets weaker with age. Well, I don't think that we've met, but there's no way you were 65. What if I said I only have one life to live, so I need protection against the flu? How about... Who's the boss of my health? You've never seen who's the boss. Oh, my, bo my boss is in the back. See, flu season is here and people 65 and older need to ask about the vaccine made specifically for their age. And it's particularly important for people who have conditions like heart disease and diabetes. True to the light, <laughs> great seeing you. Come on back. Visit the National Council on Aging at ncoa.org slash flu to learn more and talk to your doctor about vaccine options for people 65 and older. Look, I'm really sorry about that. I thought you were 35. Don't apologize. We're always ready for action. We can do it in two minutes. 
Now, when I was in high school, I couldn't do it in two minutes. By the time I got to college, two minutes was a cinch. I really like it when a guy can do it in under two minutes. The key to my marriage is doing it in under two minutes. I can do it in two minutes. I can do it in less than two minutes. I can do it in under two minutes myself and with my boyfriend. Each year, the Red Cross responds to 66,000 disasters. Most of them are home fires. Most of them are home fires. Whoa. I know. Whoa. Seven people die each day, on average, from home fires. Seven people a day. That's way too many people. You can save your life and your family's life. Make an escape plan. Make an escape plan. Make an escape plan. It's critical that everyone can get out in under two minutes. I can get from my bedroom to my front door in less than two minutes. Shh! In two minutes. I can take my shirt off, pour glitter all over myself, and still do it in two minutes. Called my mom the other day, told her I did it in under two minutes. She was so proud. One and a half. What? There's no way. Yeah. Check your smoke alarms monthly to make sure they're working properly. Smoke alarms cut your risk of death or injury in half. Half? It's 50%. This little guy, cutting it in half. And if it's beeping at you, don't rip it out of the wall. Give it a battery, you know? Make it happy so it can help you get out of the house in time. Make sure to visit redcross.org slash two steps, two minutes. Two steps. Two minutes. Two steps, two minutes. Visit the link below to find out more. Wherever it is. Not there. Here. Right here. I didn't want to talk about it earlier. Why would I want to seem like this sad sack? Those are all the lies that I told, told myself. It's like, oh, if I talk about this, even, pro even professionally with my job, if I talk about this, uh, people won't want to watch me. It's not important enough. And e even now as I'm hearing myself saying all those things, like, wow, man, I really wish that I would have spoken out earlier because there's nothing like being able to shine a light on those secrets. Those secrets kill. The, the secret of keeping all that to yourself and putting on that mask that'll eat away at you daily. It ate away at me daily. It's difficult for men in general, I think, because of just, just the way that we're made, raised. You feel any of the negative emotions or that dark cloud settle on you, and you feel like you need to cry out or speak to someone about it, no, I'm, I'm not gonna do that because my man. What kind of man would I sound like if I told somebody, hey, I am, I'm, I'm so sad. I'm cripplingly sad. I, I can't get out of bed. I just, I, I feel empty. Help me. Psst, I would be some sissy, I'd be soft. That's what you're taught. That's what you were programmed. And, uh, and that's what kills us. So in speaking about it uh, on ET and being honest, folks have come out of the woodwork. People that I haven't heard from in years, complete strangers, a ton of my, mostly on Twitter and on Facebook and social media. That's, that, that's been an amazing gauge of all the love and so many people, it's echoed the exact same sentiment. Thank you so much for speaking because I felt that I couldn't. We help our kids find their fathers if they're in different facilities around the country, write them, call them, um, visit them, um, support them when they get out of the facility because we believe it's fundamentally important to all children to know their father and it's an opportunity. Um, sometimes it's important for them because they need to forgive their father. Sometimes it's an opportunity because their father needs to forgive them. Um, sometimes we've had kids who've had very angry, violent reactions to their father without understanding what happened to their dad. So we need to facilitate their reunion. It doesn't necessarily have one into it in terms of where they're going to go off into the sunrise, but <coughs> it fills the void in both the father and the child's life, and it's the right thing to do inherently. So we do whatever 
works and we have kids who visited their fathers out of state and we've had fathers come here. When I was at Children's Hospital, we even had fathers and leg irons come to the hospital to consult me around something that happened to their job. Because you're locked up doesn't mean they don't care about their children. Other fathers are afraid to want to avoid the conflict of the truth, conflict with the mother, or the truth that they did abandon their child. Uh, some fathers want to romanticize the idea of, of incarceration was just some time I did, doesn't mean much, I'm here now, what's the problem? And they need help with understanding what the impact was on their child. And children have a variety of responses to parental incarceration that ranges. And they need to be where their child is and we help them support their child's um, acceptance of them. Or sometimes rejection of them. The child who said to her father in a group that we had, JC, no. She said to her father, I have another dad. And my mom doesn't want me to really know you. We had to help the father with that and what would be the best way to respond to it and not take out of the child but it's a more complicated discussion. A lot of incest families, a lot of the sex abuse stuff, sex offending kids. And there's this concept of apology and forgiveness. It sounds real good in a book and on paper. But it really is the holocaustic survival thing of telling the truth for us. And that's where it's ugly. Because the truth means going to the smell of it, the sound of it, the perceptions of it, what it means to a small brain, what it means to a different gender, what it means to be betrayed and hurt. I had a father stand in the homeless shelter one day and he was talking about how he had done time and there was a lot of women so you know I, I understood he was doing a little a little machismo thing because yeah he was the male in the homeless shelter and I always admire men who would come to the homeless shelter with their kids because most men will let the woman bring them they're not going to show and the kids need to see the fathers do the same things so moving through the thing showing character and going through and fixing it because they all leave into housing and happy relative to when they come in. And he was being macho. He was talking about, yeah, when I was serving time, you know what, the pedophile, we would like, we really would jack up a pedophile, we would do this. And he was just talking about, these were all sitting there and these stories were going on. And I was like, I walked by him because I came out of law enforcement preparation for role, so I'm not romanticizing none of that. And he's romanticizing being locked up and what he was doing with the pedophiles, what they all did to him. So I just said quietly, you know what, that's not very useful. She said, Dr. C, what you talking about? I said, well, you got a bunch of men taking a pedophile on in the prison? She said, yeah. I said, well, what about their kids? I said, what do you mean? I said, all these guys in there that didn't figure out how to stay free and be with their kids, who's protecting their kids from the pedophiles? Because there's many more in the community than you'll ever see in jail. He looked at me, his eyes big. I said, yeah, your burden is to not get locked up again. Because your kid needs you out here. Watching them and making sure they're safe. I spent 10 years at the hospital. I can't begin to tell you what pedophiles look like. They look like pediatricians. They look like lawyers, mental health professionals. They look like anything but the man in the playground with a coat on. They look like regular people. So telling the truth can be real painful. Um, we won't even get into the intimate truth exchange between parents themselves or the child and, and, and the parent. And sometimes they need support in mastering that truth telling before they come together. One needs support in being able to hear the truth and the other needs support in telling the truth.
But if that doesn't happen, we can't get to forgiving. Because we get to forgiving prematurely, it won't hold. It's not real. You forgive after you tell the truth. So my kid lighting the candle, we do this uh, ceremony at Christmas holiday time where our boys light candles in honor and memory of um, and forgiveness. And you have a kid walk up and light a candle to my father who raped me from seven to 10 and I forgive him. I love him. And everybody weeps deeply. Yeah, forgiving is really visceral and real, but only after you tell the truth. And that's hard. That's the work. It's not quick and dirty. It is work. But it's worthwhile. Because I see people move on and heal. No two days are alike. So every day, you prepare. For yourself. For those you love. For whatever the day may bring. Being prepared is a part of who you are. But in the case of a disaster, preparation isn't always front of mind. In an emergency when help and resources may not be available for days, being prepared is more important than ever. It's up to everyone to be informed about what types of emergencies might occur where you live or visit. Knowing the best responses for your personal circumstances is the key to maintaining your health, safety, and independence. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency and how a personal support network can assist you. Build a kit that contains the specific things you need to survive for several days. Food and water, medication and supplies, as well as any important documents you may need. Being prepared is a part of who you are, and disaster preparation is no different. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Be informed, make a plan, build a kit, get involved. Ready.gov slash my plan. I'm here for my flu shot, and I understand that there are options for people who are 65 and older. There are, but you don't look 65. It's very flattering, but you know who I am. What if I said, who's the boss of my health? You've never seen who's the boss. My boss is in the back. Flu season is here, and people who are 65 and older need to ask about the vaccine made specifically for their age. Judith Light, come on back. Visit the National Council on Aging at ncoa.org slash flu and talk to your doctor about vaccine options for people 65 and older. No. 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 No lupus. No lupus. If we're going to say no to lupus, we need to know lupus. <sighs> lupus has completely changed my life. Lupus is one of those things that takes over somebody's body and you don't know anything about it. It's just unpredictable, it's tricky, confusing. There's certain things that I can't do but I still get up every morning and do it. It's really a cool mystery. Lupus can impact any organ in the body, any organ. It was attacking my kidney. Some people, it's the brain, it's the heart. I had gone into stage four kidney failure, which sent me into respiratory failure, which almost made me lose my life. When I was first diagnosed, that's when it really kicked in, just knowing that there was no cure. I really felt like maybe I might not be able to make it through this.
we don't look like we have the disease, and I think that's also part of the problem. You can be sick even though you don't look sick. That is one of the cruel aspects of it, is there sometimes people don't believe you. Lupus does not discriminate. It can affect men, women, white, black, older, younger. I've had lupus for 10 years. I am 17 years old. I am 11. We've got to find a way to get through this. The Lupus Foundation of America is a great organization because they're getting people out there, letting people know what it's all about. And by knowing more, we'll be better able to help and unlock the mysteries that do surround lupus. There is something we can do. There is hope. Let's take this moment and turn it into a movement. End the confusion and end lupus. There is hope. We just have to get involved. I haven't given up. I challenge you to know no. 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 No, lupus. Go to lupus.org slash no and help solve this cruel mystery. The deprivation of basic needs being fulfilled impacts your brain, actually. It impacts the way you view the world. Um, I'm the child of a parent who was physically deprived and had like the two underwear and the walking to school and had nothing. I was a little piccaninny black girl in the South with nothing. And bright, but well, here's what she had. She had a grandfather who was a preacher. He only had about three or four days of school in his life, but he was a brilliant preacher. And he said to her one day, you know what? You got to be close to God because Negro women seem to find themselves needing God a lot. I say that to say to you that as she grew into adulthood, although that seed was planted, she has enormous taste in nice things. She studied nice things with people who had money. She would go and put away her little pennies and get nice things for her children. And I, on the other hand, because I never had that deprivation, when she would get three bathing suits from Fowling's Basement, i give two away to the poor kids in the community because I can't wear three at one time. I didn't have the same value of things because I didn't have the deprivation. I studied my mom. So as I look at the kids that come here, I see that deprivation is a hard thing to get over. And it does trigger a sense of inferiority. And I see that as my mother got older, she raised two children to love her because she stayed in an economically dependent situation, although she was the brilliant one, because she didn't understand her brilliance and her abilities. So your 17-year-old may not understand what else he has going on much more powerful than what he looks like. He may never fully recover from being concerned about what he looks like, because it's a brain imprint. But the only thing that will help him focus on the other opportunities for him, he has to feel profoundly, unconditionally loved. I mean, that sounds kind of simple, yeah. but unconditional love sounds like this from my study, who say, I trust adults who go with me through the trauma. My white male mentor who fought this kid all the way through failing the program, getting locked up in a psych setting. He's still visiting the kid. The kid has grown because it's taken him four or five years to believe someone cares about him. And this mentor is the only one that stayed with him. Continuity of relationship, consistency, and being there, always being honest and real, but not leaving the scene. So he can only counter this deprivation model where he's got to look like somebody because he doesn't feel like anybody. 
he got to look better than anybody because he feels like he is less than everybody. Unconditional love. So, you know, we break the rules or not break the rules because I love the kids. The better they are, the more love they need. <laughs>
uh, uprooting jazz clubs and whatever historical cultural centers that you have of black life in those communities, those are all destroyed when you have these massive displacement projects. So, you know, you see those four elements of historical trauma playing out very powerfully. I see that in my research that all four of those, I like to call it ongoing historical trauma. It's not just something that happened in the past. It's still playing out today. The, in the natural sciences, you observe phenomena and you sort of, uh, through trial and error or observation and hypothesis testing, you sort of come up with um, the way that you're going to observe a phenomenon. For me, you know, this city is, a, is my laboratory. And so I'm able to look and just sort of see, like, you know, to what degree are we segregated? You can see that. When you drive through down Charles Street, you know, if you go from Northern Parkway and you drive south, you know, all the way to downtown, then you head east on Alexander. You can see, okay, this is a, this is, that's the white part of town, but then you go to East Baltimore, West Baltimore, it's largely black. And you can, you can sense that the segregation is very palpable. So I think, you know, a lot of my research is sort of looking at and seeing, observing, you know, a lot of times I like to use maps because I think maps are very powerful. You can see like these patterns play out over and over again. For instance, bike share and bike infrastructure, which are newer systems. We're just bringing those online but you look and see where are the bike share stations, you know, where are the bike racks, where is the protected bike lanes. Chances are, or when you look at those maps, they're in the white L, or what I call the white L versus the black butterfly, which is when you look at a map of Baltimore, a racial dot map, um, you can clearly see that segregation, and then you see that the resources are clustered according to where people live, clustered in white communities, uh, by and large absent in black communities. and so. You know, I just observe and see, you know, whether we're talking about bike stations, whether we're talking about um, the economic development spending in the city. Um, you know, you can go through a whole range of areas in our budget as a city and areas in our investments that we receive from private corporations. And you see that they're more heavily clustered in the white areas of this city compared to the white, black areas of this city. No, that's a crazy story. I was um, at a meeting at Union Baptist Head, uh, yeah, Union Baptist Head Start, where I actually did my postdoctoral fellowship work um, with the men there, basically working to connect them with jobs and health insurance. And so I'm in a meeting there, and they have the the meeting, I guess, I don't even know how I got in this meeting. It was a meeting, I guess, um, for Fermanel Templeton Preparatory Academy. Maybe the director said I should be there. So I show up in this meeting, and I guess they were talking about the way in which the University of Maryland was operating and they have programs that they want to do in that community, in the Upton community. And so I'm listening and I'm like, okay, this sounds like more gentrification, more urban renewal. And so I got up and I gave like a good spiel about, you know, how I wasn't, you know, uh, how I was very worried about the University of Maryland's activity. I mean, if you look at University of Maryland during urban renewal, um, which really comes out of the Housing Act of 49 and then the Housing Act of 54, um, they displaced a good four, five, six hundred people, a majority of them African American, in that part of central West Baltimore. And so, you know, I'm thinking, that, you know, actually they're getting ready to maybe do something, I think, with the Lexington Market in a couple years. So this development that's taking place and that they were talking about, I said, mm, you know, this doesn't sound like it's going to really help or that it may threaten um, black Baltimore in that part of town. And the, the board of that school, the, the chair of that board was there. And his name was Andrew Bertamini. Um, and he was the, I didn't know it at the time, the, the president of Wells Fargo for the state of Maryland, for their banks. But he served as the board chair for uh, Furman L. Templeton Preparatory Academy. And so I was like, I gave my spill like, man, this, you know, this, this ain't right. It's gonna hurt the community. And he was, he came up to me after me. He was like, I want you to be on my board. I was like, what? <laughs> after I just dogged this whole thing out, you want me to be on the board? He's like, yeah. I said, well, I ain't gonna be on the board unless you get like my boy Dwayne Johnson, who is a longtime father and worker in that community. Like, you know, I'm a professor. You need somebody else who's like actually from the community. And so he was like, yeah. So both of us joined the board at that time um, and you know I guess you know I'm proud of the work that we've done there it's a community charter school um, so zoned to for the children that live near that school to attend that school like some charters where people can come from all over the city 
Um, but they serve the community, and I think you know we were able to look and examine policies and academic performance, and you know monitor the budget. And I think basically in the five years that I served, we were able to get a, a principal on board and executive director on board, and now they're you know in place and locked in and and ready to really move that school I think to its greatest potential. So you know we've done some good work I think at Fermino Templeton. We're always ready for action. We can do it in two minutes. Now, when I was in high school, I couldn't do it in two minutes. By the time I got to college, two minutes was a cinch. I really like it when a guy can do it in under two minutes. The key to my marriage is doing it in under two minutes. I can do it in two minutes. I can do it in less than two minutes. I can do it in under two minutes myself and with my boyfriend. Each year, the Red Cross responds to 66,000 disasters. Most of them are home fires. Most of them are home fires. Ooh. I know. Whoa. Seven people die each day on average from home fires. Seven people a day. That's way too many people. You can save your life and your family's life. Make an escape plan. Make an escape plan. Make an escape plan. It's critical that everyone can get out in under two minutes. I can get from my bedroom to my front door in less than two minutes. <laughs> in two minutes. I can take my shirt off, pour glitter all over myself, and still do it in two minutes. Called my mom the other day, told her I did it in under two minutes. She was so proud. One and a half. What? There's no way. Yeah. Check your smoke alarms monthly to make sure they're working properly. Smoke alarms cut your risk of death or injury in half. Half. It's 50%. This little guy, cutting it in half. And if it's beeping at you, <laughs> don't rip it out of the wall. Give it a battery, you know? Make it happy so it can help you get out of the house in time. Make sure to visit redcross.org slash two steps, two minutes. Two steps. Two minutes. Two steps, two minutes. Visit the link below to find out more. Wherever it is. Not there. Here. Right here. No. 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 No lupus. No lupus. If we're going to say no to lupus, we need to know lupus. <sighs> lupus has completely changed my life. Lupus is one of those things that takes over somebody's body and you don't know anything about it. It's just unpredictable, it's tricky, confusing. There's certain things that I can't do, but I still get up every morning and do it. It's really a cool mystery. Lupus can impact any organ in the body any organ. It was attacking my kidney. Some people, it's the brain, it's the heart. I had gone into stage four kidney failure, which sent me into respiratory failure, which almost made me lose my life. When I was first diagnosed, that's when it really kicked in, just knowing that there was no cure. I really felt like maybe I might not be able to make it through this. We don't look like we have the disease, and I think that's also part of the problem. You can be sick even though you don't look sick. That is one of the cruel aspects of it, is there sometimes people don't believe you. Lupus does not discriminate. It can affect men, women, white, black, older, younger. I've had lupus for 10 years. I am 17 years old. I am 11. We've got to find a way to get through this. The Lupus Foundation of America is a great organization because they're getting people out there, letting people know what it's all about. And by knowing more, we'll be better able to help and unlock the mysteries that do surround lupus. There is something we can do. There is hope. Let's take this moment and turn it into a movement. End the confusion and end lupus. There is hope. We just have to get involved. I haven't given up. I challenge you to know. No. 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 No, lupus. Go to lupus.org slash no and help solve this cruel mystery. I don't know why my son would ruin himself with alcohol. Is someone's drinking breaking your heart? You might be surprised at what you can learn in an Al-Anon family group from people just like you. Call 1-888-4-ALANON or go to alanon.org. I was very intrigued by the fellowship, Open Society Institute in Baltimore. Um, you know, you write an application about the project that you're just starting out or that you want to start 
And so, you know, I moved here in September of 2010, and I had an idea that I wanted to work with Union Baptist Head Start, which is actually one of the very first Head Starts in the entire nation. Um, it might have been like in the first five or so. It started in 1968. Um, and, you know, Head Start as a, as a program overall started in the late 60s. Um, in large part um, because of activists in the civil rights and black power movements. And so Reverend Vernon Dobson over at Union Baptist Church um, and the people there, they helped secure a head start in their, or next door to their church, or run by the church. And so I was really excited um, to partner with Union Baptist Head Start. Um, now, I mean, the legacy of the church, you have Reverend Harvey Johnson, a uh, black minister who served for like 40 years in that community, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Then you have Reverend Vernon Dobson, who would go on to serve for another, for 40 years, about uh, about 40 years as a pastor there. And so this history and this legacy of like black political leadership, black um, education, you know, that legacy was very palpable. Uh, when I went there. So the opportunity to work with men to help connect them with jobs and health insurance was really exciting for me. And it was at that time, you know, you had President Obama with the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act that was beginning to come online. So we were thinking about how we could connect men with jobs and health insurance. So I wrote a grant or an application to the Open Society Institute. Um, my program was called You're the Quarterback Game Plan for Life. And that was designed to basically, here's this scheme we need we want guys in this community to create a game plan for how they're going to get connected to jobs, resources, health insurance. And so they would have what they need to move forward in life, um, to score the proverbial touchdown, if you will. And so, you know, we wrote the grant. Um, Opus, uh, Union Baptist uh, Head Start was my host organization, and I was the fellow. And so together we were awarded the grant or the fellowship in 2012, uh, I became a fellow then. And so for the next year and a half, worked to connect um, and work with about 100 men to connect them with jobs and health insurance. And so that was very, you know, pivotal, interesting time. Um, I enjoyed that work, you know, immensely. Baltimore is like a patient in the hospital. And as that patient in the hospital is it's in critical condition. Baltimore is in critical condition. We just had an uprising, you know, almost three years ago, and um, or a little over three years ago, which sort of, you know, lets any city know that there's a state of emergency. And I don't think we've come out of that state of emergency. I think we're still in the ER. I think we're, I think we're still in critical condition because all of the factors that help precipitate the uprising they're still there. Um, racial segregation, again, we're Category 5, hyper-segregated city. You know, so it's not like, you know, we're barely segregated. We're intensely segregated, you know. And what that means is, it doesn't mean that just because black people don't live next to white people that uh, that, that somehow means black people can't be successful. Black people can be successful in their own neighborhoods. The problem is when you don't have resources in those neighborhoods. The resources are segregated. The resources, the access, the opportunity, those are clustered in white communities. And so what happens from a social dynamic is because you have all those resources, access, and opportunity clustered in white communities is that you leave black communities to fend for themselves. And even the activists in those communities, even the nonprofits, the grassroots organizations in those communities, now they have to fight each other to get the resources to come to their neighborhood. And so it sets up the terrible dynamic in this city, and it makes even black neighborhoods, it makes black organizations, it, it imposes a, a sort of crabs in the barrel sort of scenario that leaves, the, puts the city in a very dysfunctional situation. In terms of political leadership, what you find is a, a slightly different scenario where we have majority black political leadership. We're in a chocolate city. So we have a black mayor, we have a black police chief, um, interim commissioner now, 
Um, we had a white one before and then before. Well, no, we, <laughs> we've been through so many, right? We've been through so many. So actually the one we had for like two months, he was black too. Then the one before that was white and then the one before that uh, was black. So we've had several black police commissioners. We have black mayors. We've had, you know, black city council members. But what you find is that these political, black political elites, they're beholden to corporate developers. They're beholden to white, wealthy entities in our city. And so they're not really able to deliver uh, the imperatives for black community power and black community resources to our red line black communities. So we have this dynamic that leaves the city in a very dysfunctional situation. Uh, we have what I like to call Baltimore apartheid. Um, you know, you have the sort of overall American apartheid, and Baltimore is really the home of that. You know, Baltimore created racial, residential racial segregation. We pioneered residential racial segregation. We started it in 1910 with racial zoning. We helped engender more of it with racially restrictive covenants. It started in Roland Park, in northern part of our city. Um, the Roland Park Company helped pioneer those racially restrictive covenants. You know, Baltimore is ground zero for American apartheid. We created it and we maintain it. Even with the black political leadership, we are very adept at leaving structures of inclusion, or excuse me, structures of exclusion in place. And so um, it's pernicious, it's deeply rooted, and it's powerful. And very few people in power, very few elected officials, seriously understand the task before us to dismantle it, to uproot it, to tear it down. Um, because it is very sophisticated, like I say. It's not like the sort of clan in your face. I mean, we're Chocolate City, so it can't be that overt, right? It has to be sort of implicit, covert, undercover. Um, you know, to undo Baltimore apartheid, I mean, first you have to recognize, everyone has to recognize that we have it, that we are in a city where apartheid is so fundamental and foundational. You got to start there. And right now, I don't think we are at a point where people even admit in power that we have hyper segregation, that we're still uprooting and tearing communities apart through eminent domain, through mass foreclosures, mass rental evictions. Um, you know, when we tear down public housing, we don't look at how we're tearing apart communities, in fact. Um, so, I mean, we're not really, I think, honest in Baltimore about the, the root of the issues, the depth of the issues that we face. Um, but if we were honest, then I think what we could do um, is a host of things. Uh, number one, the thing that I like to start with is what I call a $3 billion racial equity social impact bond. And that would kickstart Baltimore towards uh, a path of racial equity. Um, about half of that would be spent on getting rid of lead poisoning alone. Because lead poisoning is in our homes, it's in our soil, it's in our water, in our school system, in the, in the pipes. The children can't even drink water. The schools ship in bottled water. I mean, we know lead is this neurotoxin that negatively impacts black babies, predominantly in Baltimore City. Um, so half of that is just getting rid of that toxin that destroys and hurts black lives. Freddie Gray was lead poisoned. You know, Corinne Gaines, even though she was killed by police in Baltimore County, she was poisoned in Baltimore City. And there are thousands of Freddie Grays, thousands of Korean Gaines that are still out there. So half of the social impact bond is getting rid of lead poison. The other half, $500 million, is on building and rehabbing housing for folks who are homeless. Uh, so we can make housing first a real policy um, and make sure we're not um, putting people in shelters, we're actually putting people in homes. And then the last billion is really a, a plethora. You know, we need to expand violence prevention initiatives like Safe Streets, like Baltimore Ceasefire. You know, we have like maybe five Safe Street sites right now. Given our murder rate, we need 40 Safe Street sites. And so let's invest in violence prevention. Let's invest in substance abuse prevention. Right now, we've had over 300 or so murders the past three years. Each year, well... We've, we started out with a roughly equal number of opioid overdoses. We're at over 700 opioid overdoses as of last year. 
So right now, our opioid overdoses have doubled our homicides. So we need to expand our substance abuse uh, programming in the city. Um, I would, you know, even actually go as far as to freeze um, foreclosures, freeze rental evictions, a six-month moratorium so that people can get on their feet because there's stress associated with trying to save your home, getting ready to get put out on the street and that sort of thing. And Baltimore is number one per capita in rental evictions. So we're very good at kicking people out of their home, and that creates the homelessness. So I think we've got to look at that. Um, so this $3 billion racial equity impact bond, that's a start. But what's needed beyond that is what I also like to call the Baltimore Freedom Budget. Right now we have an apartheid budget. We spend more on policing, over $500 million. We spend more on policing than we do on health, housing, arts, parks, civil rights, and workforce development combined. And that's shameful. And that's an apartheid budget because what you're doing is you're saying we're going to spend more money to catch people after they mess up as opposed to spending more money on those sort of budget items that will help keep people from going into a life of crime. And so we need to flip that dynamic. Let's spend more on supporting life and less on social control. Um, so that moving towards the Baltimore Freedom Budget, I think, is pivotal. And then alongside that, I think we should take 10% of our annual general fund, our budget, and allocate that towards what I call Baltimore neighborhood reparations. Because what we've done for over 100 years is we've starved black communities. We've choked them. We've sucked up the resources. We've kept them from having opportunity access and resources. And so, and we've done that as a city, as the city government has helped play a powerful role in that along with the private industry. And so the city has an obligation for the next 40 or 50 years, in my book, if not more, because we've imposed apartheid for 100 years. It may take that long to actually take 10% of our budget and give that to the f top 20 or so red line black communities, split it evenly so that they can invest in their neighborhoods. The, what is called democratically elected community council can come together, 15 member council, um, that's racially, ethnically, um, sexual identity uh, sort of representative so that folks from different backgrounds, age representation, you need youth and elders and everybody in between to be a part of this council. And so they're elected and put on the council and you have representation from all angles and they get to decide how that money gets to be spent in their community. And you rotate people in and out, you know, maybe a two, three, four year term. But, I mean, that's also a big part of the plan. Like, we need to repair the damage that was done to those black neighborhoods that have been systemically redlined, systemically subprimed. And so I think it's going to take a systemic undoing of apartheid to make that happen. And, you know, we have to actually, we have to open up housing mobility so that more black people, more lower income black people can live in wealthier white communities. And if, and then... On the corollary to that is we've got to make black neighborhoods matter. Because if we invest in those black neighborhoods, then everybody will want to live there. So what will happen is housing mobility for into white communities, building up black communities, then you'll get more mixing and we'll see desegregation actually begin to take place. And, and that's what we need. We can't continue. It's not sustainable to have this hyper-segregated reality. At least not when you have the resources clustering so heavily based on the type of people who live in a community. So we got to mix it up. We got to mix it up so that you don't know, who, you know, or you do know people of all backgrounds live in a community. So we're going to spend and make sure every community is doing well. Um, right now, there was a report a couple years ago, um, or last year, the Baltimore City Planning Department, they have an equity office, and they did a study, and they showed that the city's capital budget in the capital budget for Baltimore City that the city over the past five years was spending twice as much in predominantly white neighborhoods compared to what they were spending in predominantly black neighborhoods. So even in our capital budget, we have racial inequity. And that was just for the past five years. You know, what if you did a 100-year study? So that's why you need neighborhood reparations because we, we are still, even up to 2017, 
putting more money into white neighborhoods that are already wealthier, that already have access and resources compared to black neighborhoods. So those would be the types of solutions that I would put forth. Um, and there's more, I'm sure. Uh, rent control, you know, university basic income. You know, we think very creatively because uh, poverty, segregation, you know, is so systemic. So let's be, you know, let's be innovative and let's be bold. The problems aren't small, so our solution shouldn't be small.